Welcome to the Atheists of Florida YouTube channel. We are pleased to offer some of the most significant speakers and the profound issues of our times. If you like today's video, please hit the like button. If you have already subscribed, thank you. If not, you know what to do. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now we're at a point where we can go ahead and get started. Okay. So, um, yes, thank you all very much for inviting me. Um, doing in-person events, and this is, I understand this is as close as we can come in, in many cases, but it's so much the, the most important and most fun part of what I do. Uh, I'm, I'm a full-time skeptical science communicator, whatever science writer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Skeptoid Media, we have uh, five full-time employees, a number of volunteers in, in various roles. We're supported about 80% by listener donations to the Skeptoid podcast and about 20% um, by sponsorship through the NPR, National Public Radio um, a network of, of podcasts and everything. Uh, and um, the reason we were complaining about the costs of Meetup is because 2022 with Putin invading Ukraine and the resulting uncertainties about recession, the podcast sponsorship uh, went down 80% in 2022, wow. and it's not expected to recover now until Q1 of 2024. So even though that's only 20% of our revenue, losing 20% of your revenue is quite a lot. So we've had to really tighten our belts around here. So doing something like this virtually is you know, easy and and free and fun. So I really appreciate the opportunity to stay engaged with the, with, with the folks out in the real world out there. So today I'm going to talk about um, conspiracy theories. This is one of the usual talks that I give. Um, we are all conspiracy theorists because it's actually kind of a normal thing. So often we all tend to dismiss conspiracy theorists as crazy or um, what's wrong with those people or they are all part of the political party that I hate the most, whichever one that is. And depending on where in the country I go to give this talk, it might be a completely di different answer to that question. So this, you, you will find that this talk is uh, intended, at least to, to the best of my efforts, to be unbiased in any direction and a totally objective view of the science. Because there is substantial science behind conspiracy theory belief. Uh, one of my good friends that I work with a lot is um, at the uh, Univer at University of Miami, and his lab is probably the biggest repository in the world of conspiracy theory research from every country, polling tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people over years and years over what do you believe, and do you believe this and this or this or this, and what are your demographics, and trying to come up with understandings of who believes what and why, and how this kind of thing comes, comes to be part of, of culture. So that's, that's really the, the genesis of, of this presentation. So I'm going, going to go ahead and jump right in. Let's see. Uh, OK, so now you're seeing the, the, the second slide, correct? Yes? Yes. OK, so I'm, I'm a science writer. And everyone who is a science writer who communicates science gets these kinds of comments to some degree or another. Um, women get it far worse than men do. And uh, a large part of the reason that uh, you don't see as many women science communicators, you see just as many coming out of uh, college and getting their careers started, but they tend to get out early because of the rape threats and death threats and murder threats and everything that we all get. It, it's just part of the game. Basically correcting misinformation is not the way to win a popularity contest. People who are invested in misinformation are often invested very, very passionately. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the result that you see. Facts are never as popular. Oops. Did I just accidentally switch screens? No. You're still seeing a screen with just the six things, right? Yes. You don't, okay, I, I apologize for the uh, dis disruption there. No so facts are never going to be as popular as the weird stuff that people want to believe based on their beliefs, their tribe, what have you. So I want to talk about one guy in particular right now. 
Uh, the picture you're seeing, most of us recognize. I've had to change this talk for different audiences. If I'm going to give this presentation to a university audience, well, those kids are like 18 years old, and they don't have no idea what this picture refers to. This, of course, is the 1993 uh, burning of the Branch Davidian complex, in which 76 people died. Now, what you're seeing is the view from where the media were camped out. There was an enormous crowd of thousands of media literally camped out here for weeks from where this photo was taken. Right behind the media was an even larger crowd of estimated 300,000 people who had traveled from all over the country to be here and watch and looky-loo and see what was going to happen. One young man in particular was among that 300,000 people. He believed that the US was actively waging war against its own citizens. And what we were seeing here was an example of that. He believed that he was a soldier in this war against the US government. This guy wrote threat letters to FBI agents, often addressing them personally by name. Uh, including the Pete the Sniper who killed Randy Weaver's wife at Ruby Ridge, if anyone remembers that. He was active on the gun show circuit. He would travel to gun shows all the time. And he had been a member of the NRA, but he quit the NRA because he believed they were too soft on gun rights. <laughs> he went into business selling ammonium nitrate to others who believed as he did and who wanted to have some sort of a super weapon to keep in their stockpile or whatever, uh, should the US increase, step up its war on its own citizens. Well, some of you may know who I'm talking about, some of you may not. This picture may bring it into sharper focus. In 1995, he filled a rental truck with his own product and he drove it to Oklahoma City and he parked it in front of the Oklahoma City Federal Building. He set a two minute fuse and he walked away. Mm -hmm. The explosion that this caused was absolutely shattering. If you look at the other buildings in this picture, do you see any glass in any of their windows? No. <laughs> there was 300 buildings were damaged. The building directly across the street, which is below the helicopter that took this photograph, had to be dismantled. It was, it was so badly damaged by the explosion. 168 people were killed, including 19 children, which made him only the United States' second worst mass murderer of children. So who am I talking about? Shout it out if you know it. Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. He was executed in 2001. So the title of this talk is, We Are All Conspiracy Theorists. Does that mean that I'm saying we're all just like Timothy McVeigh? Well, yes and no. Maybe in some ways, maybe not in some other ways but let's continue. So the first question to ask is, what do we mean when we say a conspiracy theory? Um, we're not talking about uh, Watergate or price fixing, which are of course real conspiracies that real happen. Uh, senators killing Julius Caesar, this, these are all real conspiracies that really happened. We're looking for something that's specific. It's, it's, gotta, it's gotta be false. When we say conspiracy theory, we refer, we refer to as false conspiracy theory. So none of those things that I just mentioned. Um, it also has to be specific enough to be falsifiable. You can't just say, oh, I think the government is up to something evil. Okay, well, we all know the government's up to all kinds of things that we don't know about. That's kind of their job. The jobs of the clandestine services are to do things in secret that we don't know about. But something that would be specific enough to be falsifiable would be, United Airlines sprays poison gas from their jets to dumb down the population and make them susceptible to being placed into termination camps, as so many people believe. The third thing I think that qualifies a conspiracy theory is that it, it's, it's in fact a future prediction. It claims that something is going to be discovered that has not be, been discovered yet. So whatever you're claiming, you have to be right and you have to be saying it before it's discovered by the media, by, by investigative journalists, by law enforcement, what have you. If you haven't done that, you're not making it, it's not a conspiracy theory. If that's all happened already, if it's been discovered, it was a real conspiracy, 
And if none of that ever happens, then you're making a future prediction that may or may not come through. So these are what we mean when we say conspiracy theory. So um, let's go ahead and activate that poll. Um, does everyone have a poll on their screen somehow? Okay, so question one. Um, don't answer yet. Here's what you're looking at. This is an animation of some, some blocks moving up and down. Uh, it's about 10 seconds long and it repeats. That doesn't really matter. What I want you guys to, to look at and try and determine is, are these blocks moving randomly and independently? Or is there some method or pattern that determines the way that they're moving? So I'll give you five or 10 seconds to think about that. And then just answer. Um, I just want to make sure, can someone answer me verbally? Are you all able to answer randomly or according to some method? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, it's a tricky question because technically. <laughs> Judy, do you see the answers? I don't have the answers on mine. Mine says zero people have answered. Well, I would uh, think well, that these these blocks would have to be controlled by a computer animated uh, animation and therefore a, a computers don't act random. So well, but therefore, you can certainly put in a random function and tell the computer to move them randomly or you can tell them to move to some line. But what, what's well, actually happening is not important. What we're looking for is what is your perception? What do you guys think is happening here? I'm going to go ahead and move on. So I actually have no idea whether what's determining the way these blocks move. That doesn't matter. What matters is what you perceived. Because if you answered that they're moving according to some method, then that means you are most likely to be tended to, to tend toward conspiratorial thinking. If you answer that they're moving randomly, that means you're less likely to be a conspiracy theorist. So if you said they're moving according to some method, you just outed yourself. Congratulations. <laughs> I, will, so, uh, I will say that Dominic says that because we set it up as seven questions, you have to answer the whole thing before. Right. Oh, is that before right? Before it will yeah. take. So that's that was my bad. I'm oh, sure no, that's, that's, that's my bad too then, because that's what I asked you to set up. Okay, so but forget all that. We won't the use other. the polls anymore, which is fine. Yeah. No, so, I can do the others, Brian. I can do well, the other questions. Okay. Um, well, we got we got a few minutes before we get to those. So if you want to type yeah. this, I guess those would have to be entered as separate polls. Yeah. Okay. Apologize again for the disruption, everyone. So we will now continue. Um, whoops, what did I do? So paranoia is an evolved trait. That when, when we when we look at a conspiracy theorist, we think of someone who is overly paranoid and that's when we say an evolved trait we mean it's nature tempered with nurture so the classic example that we hear all the time is the the early proto-humans on the savannah and you hear the wind rustling the grass do you think that that is just the wind rustling the grass or do you think that there is some malevolent force at work if you're the more paranoid of the true you run to a tree and you climb up to the top if you're more laissez-faire and you think, oh, that's just the wind, it doesn't mean anything, well, then occasionally you get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. And even if you have the fancy hairdo and the superhuman physique, um, you still are going to get eaten by the tiger incrementally more often that your population gradually diminishes. And so that's why the leading theory, anyway, that's why paranoia is an evolved trait in the human species. And it's not just humans. If you think of deer or other wild animals, if you come upon them in the forest, what are they likely to do? They're more likely to just bolt and run because they also have learned this native paranoia as a protection technique. So there's nothing too surprising about that. However, we as humans have the extra intelligence that we're able to temper our experiences with, with just what has happened to us in our life. You know, where we grew up, what is our circle of friends? What is our background? What's our family life? What are the schools we went to, the jobs we had? 
everyone has very different answers to all of these questions. What's our socioeconomic status? What's our ethnic background? We have very, very different life experiences. What books have we read? What TV shows? What movies have we watched? All of these things dramatically impact our perception of how the world actually works. So we all have a very different degree to which we temper this native paranoia. And that's a very fascinating thing. And that's really the core of why I say we're all conspiracy theorists, because we all started at the same place, but we've all tempered that, that, that nature with the nurture of our own very unique life experiences. So let's look at the three reasons that conspiracy theories are attractive. Well, so number one is they make complex topics simple. For example, who, who among us really understands international monetary policy and everything that goes along with that? It's much simpler to simply say, the Rothschilds control everything, the Jews do it. But it that's a much simpler explanation. It takes a very complicated topic and allows us to wrap our arms around it and make it into something we can easily understand. Number two, they make they 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 alter the reality of the world to make it better fit our worldview. If I'm someone who's natively anti-Semitic, then anything that says though the Jews are behind it, well, that makes it fit my worldview. And I can promote that that viewpoint as if it's the true one, and suddenly I'm right about everything. That's another way. And furthermore, everyone wishes to have a better sense of control over their own lives and over the world in general and over their circumstances. And when you feel that you understand everything better than everyone else, it confers upon you a sense of control that you might not have otherwise. These are the three basic reasons that people tend to believe conspiracy theories. Okay, so now let's go to our next poll question. So Judy, do we have this? Can we, can we put the second one up? Yes. Okay. So we're gonna talk about who is most susceptible. And I'm gonna throw at you, uh, I think about five, five choices, five A to B choices. The first one is younger or older. And you see that on your screen right now. Who is more susceptible to conspiratorial thinking, younger people or older people? I wanna stress that conspiracy ideation cuts more or less equally across every demographic. You cannot say this group believes in conspiracy theories, this group does not. Their tribe does, my tribe does not. There are, however, five and only five of these, of these dichotomies that we're going to answer now that have a statistically different, a st statistically significant difference between them. Younger and older is one of them. I see right now most of us have answered younger people, and that's actually correct. Younger people are more likely than older people to be conspiracy theorists. Okay, so let's grab the next question now. And it's more educated or less educated. Um, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> oh, okay. I wasn't sure if that was me being slow trying to find no. it. Okay, so this is, thank you for doing this. I'm sorry, this, everyone, this is my bad um, about being a little bit unprepared for how the Zoom surveys work. And I haven't done a survey in a long time, so it's okay. just as much. This <laughs> so one. this is on there as question number two. three, and it says two. Yeah. Who's more susceptible, more educated or less educated? I, I don't have that question. All I have is the results of uh, younger, older. If you click, okay. there should be a back link near the top of that little window. Yep. And that should bring up the list. Yep, I got it. Window. I just, I didn't uh, stop sharing this, the second one. All right, I have it now. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay, so more educated or less educated? We've got less educated is so far the unanimous vote. Are you guys sure about that? You want to <laughs> you want to double think it for a minute? I'm not getting it. I'm not getting the poll. I'm getting only more or less educated. I'm not getting the choices. That's what we're looking for. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I did something wrong. 
No. Those are the tricks. <laughs> I actually did. I actually did uh, vote for less educated, but I know for a fact that, for example, one of the most famous uh, uh, conspiracy theory is uh, flat Earth, and yeah. it has a lot of educated people in it. Well, change your vote. I'll tell you in a second if you're right or wrong. <laughs> Well, I won't still... change it. No, I, I won't change it. I'm going to keep it that way because I think that flat earth thing is just like you know, a fluke or something. Okay, I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is less educated is correct. But when we get through all five of these, I'm going to ask you to find the pattern between them. So pay attention to that as well. Okay, so let's go on to the next one, uh, which is more educated or, or higher or in, lower income. One of the five dichotomies in which there is a statistically significant difference, not a big difference. It is like, we're talking like 49% and 51% oh. rather than 50-50, like all the other political party, everything else you can think of. Okay, we've got overwhelmingly people are choosing lower income. That is also correct. Lower is correct. So, so far we've got, um, what do we have? Higher or lower income? Um, we've got lower income, less educated. Um, and Younger. now let's go to the next one, which is male or female. Wait, I have to... No worries. We're all just screwing around on a Sunday afternoon. This does <laughs> not have right. to be done well by any stretch of the imagination. That's a good thing. <laughs> now you see why atheists don't invite you. <laughs> <laughs> I give too much of a work assignment. So we're going for almost uh, very powerfully, we're leaning toward male. You are all wrong. Females are more likely to have higher conspiracy ideation. Mm. So now let's go to- I was right. <laughs> question five. Question five is blacks or whites? You've got lots of other races, but we do not have a statistically significant difference between them. Black versus white is the one that there's a statistically different, God, I can't talk, statistically significant difference. We're closer to 50-50, leaning more toward white. I mean, we all see the pictures of the guys carrying the torches on their way to the yes. valley or whatever the hell that's, that was. That's who we see mostly. That's who we see. You are incorrect. Blacks are more likely to be conspiracy theorists than whites. Hmm. That actually kind of makes sense. So let's close that out of the way. And now let's talk about what is the pattern. Why do we think that these groups are more conspiratorial thinking? What is their life experience? What is it that's happened to them that I makes- I think them it's think? about uh, the, uh, the environment that is enriching the uh, theory, uh, the conspiracy theory uh, soil, let's put it that way. It's just a way that once you're well-educated or well, let's um, let me rephrase that. Once you are well-equipped to have an environment which is well-educated and gives you the facts that you need to fight all the conspiracy theories or the falseness is around, will help you more to be you know, more immune to it. I'm going to that say that's sense. not correct. I'm going to say that's how, not correct. And I apologize. How about because... uh, empowerment? That's closer. What we're really talking about is people who have had a harder time in life. So when we look at younger people, they tend to be less financially secure than older people. They have bills and credit cards that are late. They have all of these problems. The company, the, the man is harassing them to pay their credit card bills. In their mind, younger people are more at the receiving end of the ire of these big powerful corporations. We see the same things with people who are lower income or who are less educated. They tend to have, I mean, those two things go together very well. They tend to have the bill collectors after them. They tend to have all kinds of problems that wealthier people with better jobs, with better incomes, with better education don't have. In their life experience, 
the things that conspiracy theorists complain about actually do happen to them more often than they do to the people who are more secure. And that's why we have women and black people in here more because their life stories are filled with more trouble, more problems, more harassment than are white men. And so when you have life experience that teaches you that yes, the system is set up to make you fail, you're more likely going to believe in conspiracy theories that make the same basic claim. Um, I was thinking about um, for African-Americans, the, um, um, the experiments they did on them with syphilis during, I think it was during World War II, mm -hmm. where they were not treated, even though they told, they told them they were being treated, uh, that okay. they've been lied to a lot more. Uh, and women who were forcibly uh, sterilized. Um, yeah, and we're going to talk about some of those in a minute. Oh, but you're sorry. absolutely right. Uh, you're talking about people who have a learned reason to distrust authority. Yes. So really, I mean, the, the moral of the story should be hug a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> it's not that they're stupid. It's not that they're evil. It's that they, in general, um, if, you, if, you're, if you are going to try and make a generalized statement about them, um, but I'm the first to say it's always wrong to paint any group with a large brush. But conspiracy theorists do tend to have had a harder path than, than non-conspiracy theorists. Now, you have some questions in the chat from uh, Michael okay. Pollock. I, I'd rather hold the questions. Okay. Till okay. So let's continue with conspiracy theories are tribal. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, either Republicans or Democrats are more likely to be conspiracy theorists, because we know from the data that it's essentially 50-50. It, what, what it comes down to is which conspiracy theory does each group believe in? So while conspiracy theories are tribal, it's that each conspiracy theory has its own particular tribe to whom it appeals the most. Now, don't worry about the text on this screen. I know it's very small and it's hard to read, but what's important is that you see the curve. You've got a list of various conspiracy theories down the side, and you've got political affiliation left or right. And we can see that some appeal to everyone equally, some appeal more to conservatives, some appeal more to liberals. And so basically every conspiracy theory does have a demographic to whom it's most appealing. Here's a really easy way to illustrate that. Let's look at this question. Blank finances all the most evil un-American activity. <laughs> now, is that the Koch brothers or is that George Soros? Depends <laughs> if you're a Republican <laughs> or a Democrat, you're going to answer that probably either of those two ways. Each are equally false. And <laughs> this is another, this is so hilarious because I've got to start collecting video of this. Depending on where in the country I give that talk, depending who the audience is, well, yes, but the Koch brothers, I, that actually is true. Or <laughs> yes, but George Soros, that actually is true. And here come all the references and the articles and everything. It's, 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 it's almost hilarious how perfectly that works out, depending on who the audience is. So if we go to the same thing here, blank is or are responsible for all the country's problems. Is that the 1% or is that immigrants? Because I bet if you're a Democrat, you can easily answer that question. What are you saying? So here's, here's the analogy I like to give. It doesn't matter whether you go around the left side of the goat or the right side of the goat. If you go too far, you end up in a bad place. The <laughs> asshole. <laughs> this is a slide that I just put up in all my presentations. In case anyone comes in, it looks like we're doing work. So <laughs> that wasn't funny when I first started putting this in, and it's still not funny today. So let's continue. Follow the money. This is often claimed by conspiracy theorists to be the way to solve the truth behind any theory. You can find out if something is true or not, just follow the money, see who benefits, and you'll know who's behind whatever the evil activity is. Well, if this was true, then, well, 
ambulance companies, they make money off of every car accident. Does that mean they cause the car accidents? Hallmark makes money every time there's a holiday. Does that mean they created the holiday? Some no, just because someone has been able to effectively monetize something, it doesn't mean they created it or they're behind it. Just about anything that happens in the world, there is a way to monetize it. And it doesn't mean that that person monet, uh, created it or is responsible for it. So follow the money in almost every case is about the worst rubric possible for determining the truth behind a conspiracy theory. Another really popular claim is question everything. Nothing is above being questioned. We should question everything. Well, I, I actually did a whole episode of my podcast on this claim, question everything. There are three basic times when you should not question something. One of them is if it's like, are we talking the JFK, who killed JFK? This is something that has already been questioned to death. You are not going to come up with something that nobody else ever has before you. You are not going to find something that the police and the FBI and the CIA and everyone else could not find. If something has already been questioned to death, it's not that it's above being questioned. It's that it's a waste of your time to question it. Another one is if it's axiomatic. Two plus two equals four, okay? Don't question that. It's a waste of your time. You can. It's not above being questioned. It's just a waste of your time to do so. And the third one that I say is if something is so ridiculous, don't question something that would be incredibly ridiculous to question. For example, if I'm walking down the sidewalk, do I need to worry that each successive square of concrete is going to be a hologram that I might fall through? You couldn't get through your day if you questioned everything. Some things are just too silly to be worth your time to question. Nothing is above being questioned. It's just a waste of your time to do so. So question everything. If you hear someone say that, they don't know what they're talking about. In fact, I just gave my three examples, so I'm going to skip to the next slide. Da, ba, 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 blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I gave them out of order. I apologize. You can fire me and not hire me again. <laughs> so we actually did the math on how you could determine the validity of any given conspiracy theory. This is a paper by actually a friend of mine, David Robert Grimes, came out in 2017, is the date on here? I wanna say 17, that might, may or may not be right. He came up with a formula, looking at a number of actual real world conspiracies, including Watergate and several others like that, some price fixing schemes, and looked at how many people were involved, how long did it remain a secret before it was discovered, and by doing this, he came up with a formula, including all of these mathematical formulas that we're not going to go into here. But you can plug in the numbers for any given conspiracy theory. NASA fakes the moon landings. United Airlines is spraying chemicals to dumb down the population. Whatever it is, you can put in there the numbers and how long it's been, how many people would know about it, um, what's the likelihood of it being discovered in a given amount of time, and you can find out how likely or unlikely is it that we would know whether this one is true or not. And it's really funny because almost every conspiracy theory comes out to like a 0% probability. But it's a, it's a great paper, and it's been very well cited, and it basically made this dude's career. It's funny, he's like a biologist or something. It has nothing to do with what he does for a living. So this is the most popular question that I get is what conspiracy theories have been proven true? Because everyone has their, their pet one that they, that they believe in. I actually went on the Joe Rogan podcast in 2014 to specifically challenge him on his history of promoting <laughs> conspiracy theories. That did not go over well at all. Um, the, the number of death threats and emails calling me a cunt was just astonishing. That's apparently the best word that Rogan fans are able to come up with, with their, their superior intelligence. Um, I said on the show, okay, obviously you all disagree with me. If you feel there's a conspiracy theory that has been proven true, email it to me. I will take the five most common ones and I'll do a show on all five of those. And so I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails uh, well, at discounting the ones that just had a one word 
uh, accusation. <laughs> and, um, and I put a show together. So now I'm going to go through the five most common conspiracy theories people say have been proven true. Number one is the Gulf of Tonkin. What you're looking at here is the USS Maddox in, uh, in 1964. This had a real engagement with North, Viet North Vietnamese tor torpedo boats on August 2nd. But on August 4th, 1964, during the night, it had an engagement that probably didn't take place. The gunners on the ship were firing at radar targets that were intermittent. And as this was happening, the captain of the ship was on the phone to Washington, D.C. saying, I don't think there's any North Vietnamese boats out there. I think these are just glitches on the radar screen. I don't think there's anyone else out there. And as he was on the phone, one of the U.S. senators, Wayne Morris, was actually holding an all night long press conference, relaying this information to the press, telling the press there are not actually any Vietnamese gunboats. The Maddox is at war with nobody. Nobody is attacking us right now. And yet conspiracy theorists claim this as a conspiracy theory that was proven true. I say no, because it never existed as a conspiracy theory. It was known literally from the moment it was happening that it was false, that there were no North Vietnamese gunboats. Conspiracy theorists cannot claim credit for having figured out something that was public knowledge since day one. Number two is COINTELPRO. We all recognize this handsome young gentleman here. I was actually going to do a podcast episode on J. Edgar Hoover myths, uh, but the only myth about him apparently that's false is the one that he wore women's underwear, women's dresses, dressed in drag, whatever. There's apparently no evidence that that ever actually happened, but everything else about him is true. Everything else you might say about him turns out to be true. He was quite a piece of work. So it was going to be a real short episode, so I never actually produced it. But anyway, COINTEL Pro, 1956 to 1967, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI surveilled, harassed, subverted any civil rights groups, basically, anyone that he considered to be subversive to the United States. Now, in 1971, when this ended, it ended because there was a group of eight anti-Vietnam War protesters who broke into an FBI field office in Pennsylvania thinking they were going to find information that proved the Vietnam War was unfounded or something. And they found a thousand pages on what came to be known as COINTELPRO. That day they mailed it all to the newspapers. The newspapers read everything, they published it. And that's when the world first became aware of COINTELPRO. It's when the newspapers published everything. Again, this is something that never existed as a conspiracy theory. COINTELPRO was not suspected. Nobody wrote about it. Nobody published about it. Nobody said, this is my conspiracy theory that I think is going on until it became public information. It never existed as a conspiracy theory. Number three is the assassination of Martin Luther King. Now, we all know that Martin Luther King was killed by James Earl Ray, but a certain number of people have always said, nope, the government had him assassinated. It was not this guy, or he was a pansy, or whatever. Uh, this guy named Lloyd Jowers was someone who was a crackpot, who had nothing to do with the killing, but he later, quote unquote, came forward and said, I killed him. I was paid by the government to do it. And the King family believed him, and the King family sided with him. And they all got together and they agreed that the King family would sue him for $100 for wrongful death or whatever. And so the, the defendant was, of course, the US government, which did not even bother to show up for this ridiculous lawsuit. And so the King family won by default. So according to a US court of law, Lloyd Jowers is actually the one who killed Martin Luther King. Now, when you understand the facts of why that is, of course, it seems silly and it is not proof of anything. Every single criminal investigation in history has found that James Earl Ray did it. So the conspiracy theorists are simply wrong on this one. It was not Lloyd Jowers. It was James Earl Ray. 
despite this court decision that was won simply by default and not on any merits. Number four, this is, we mentioned this earlier, the Tuskegee experiments, 1932 to 1972. At a public health clinic in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, we had a population here, of mostly Black Americans, which had a lot of syphilis going on. The experimenters in the, the scientists in the public health clinic, they studied the progress of the disease for all these people over many years. They studied the progression of the disease and did not treat anyone. They studied the progression. They did not treat them even after the development of penicillin, which could have cured many of them, if not all of them. It was revealed in 1972 after a public, a former public health service investigator kind of blew the whistle on this whole thing, and he provided complete details to the newspapers. Until he did that, what was happening at this Tuskegee experiment was unknown to the general public. It was unknown to conspiracy theorists, there were no published conspiracy theories claiming that this was going on without any evidence. Again, this is one that simply never existed as a conspiracy theory. Nobody knew anything about it at all until it was proven. We had all the information that was made public. This was a conspiracy. It was not a conspiracy theory proven true. And those are two very different things. Number five, here's our last one. Does anyone recognize this handsome young man? If you're one of my college audiences, I guarantee you do not, which means I have to put up a whole different version of this talk for these people. This is Gary Webb. He was a reporter for the San Jose Mercury News. Um, he wrote a series of articles called Dark Alliance about how the CIA was looking the other way while the drug cartels shipped drugs to the United States in exchange for guns and money. 1998 is when he published the book, Dark Alliance. Now here's the problem. He was largely right and much of what he revealed was true, but where he went too far and where, he where it was false was that the CIA was actively involved in selling these drugs on the street and trying to get people, mostly black people, addicted to cocaine. That's false. There's no evidence that ever happened. Gary Webb did go too far with that. But the people who believed that felt Gary Webb did not go far enough. And so really, nobody liked his book. He got harassment from every side. Does anyone know what happened to Gary Webb? Shout it out, unless you're muted. Okay. Well, he took his own life. Hmm. Uh, all of the public harassment was just too much for the poor guy. He was largely right. He did go too far. He didn't go far enough for some people. So again, this is a case that it never existed as a conspiracy theory. We've got one very good reporter, an investigative journalist, who did a tremendous amount of work and revealed the whole thing, just like the guys did with Watergate. Um, and it was something that was never suspected or published by conspiracy theorists until it was made public. So five conspiracy theories proven true. Nope, not a single one of them had ever been a conspiracy theory that was proven true. So we're gonna finish with one little thing here, which indicates how bad all of our perceptions are. <laughs> our perceptions suck. So can we bring up that next little, uh, the, the final thing? Do you have that? Yes. With the six choices? Okay, here we go. Um, which of these items is the same size as the full moon if you hold it out at arm's length? So go outside at night, hold one of these items up to the sky at arm's length between your fingers, and one of them is exactly the same size as the full moon. Is it a BB, a P, a dime, a quarter, a golf ball, or a tennis ball? Oh, come on, only four of you have answered. All right, there's five. Well, scientifically, it changes. And by the way, since you just mentioned that, um, I think it's tonight or tomorrow night or the night after that, we are, we're going to have a super moon. So the size uh, really actually varies. Yeah. But you're talking about a single single digit percentage points in size difference. It's not that big, that, that big of a difference. Mm -hmm. It's clearly in the range of one of these six items and not in the range of any of the other five. 
I will tell you at this point, we're about halfway through the voting here, that the most common answer is a quarter. And when I say that, I'm curious to see if the votes for quarter go up or down. <laughs> I didn't say it was wrong. Okay. Want me to end the poll? Go ahead and end the poll. There was only one vote for the correct answer, which is a P. Mm -hmm. Next time there's a full moon, in fact, with the super moon, go outside, hold your hand up at arm's length, and put your thumb and forefinger on either side of the full moon, and then look at them, and you're going to see that it's the size of a P. It's nowhere near the size of a dime. It's quite surprising to many people. Won't that so, depend on the length of your arms? To, to some degree, but again, we're talking about it's not that, that big of a variation. I was talking about a really big baby. <laughs> yeah, one of those big giant plastic ones for the airsoft. Yeah, I was thinking of a BB that, you know, <laughs> like to kill a I think that none, none of us actually tried this the full arm thing, the, the arm length thing. It just like whatever we perceive from our eyes, without our arms, we just answered. Well, I have short arms too, so BB is okay. <laughs> this, this is the amazing thing about this, though. I mean, how many times have we all seen the full moon? You know, hundred. I should, I should probably know the answer to that. How many do we have in a year? 13? Is that right? 13 times I your age. Look, so, I actually look, look for it every night. <laughs> we've, seen, we've seen hundreds of full moons. And yet none of us, one out of 16 of us, has any idea of about what size that it is in the sky. That's pretty amazing. And that gives us just, I mean, that dips our toe in the water of how bad our perceptions can be about things. Brains are great at analyzing concepts and analyzing general ideas. But as far as accumulating facts and data, brains are terrible. You can do much better by just writing things down on a pad and paper than you could with remembering. If I were to recite a string of numbers or a whole bunch of measurements or something, your brain can't deal with that. You forget them all immediately. But you write them down on a piece of paper and a suddenly a pad and paper is way smarter than your brain is at collecting data not at collecting ideas or abstracting things so it's just it's it's just a great a great thing to remember that when someone is wrong about something that's well within the normal range of variation for how any of our brains can be wrong about any given thing at any time isn't that why um eyewitness testimony is such a, a, a um untrustworthy yeah yeah exact same thing if you ask us to remember what kind of what color belt the guy was wearing when he walked in the room nobody has any idea right. but we all remember the general idea of who walked into the room and what they were about and what they wanted and what they were doing but we can't remember their hair color we can't remember their clothes because none of that's important our brains have learned a certain way to discriminate between what what data is usually going to be important what data is usually not going to be important and we need to know that there's a person here telling us the building's on fire and we need to escape, telling us all that he's holding us up and he's going to kill us all and steal our money, or telling us all that we've won a million dollars. These are the important things. It doesn't matter what color vest he's wearing under his shirt. Um, who would wear a vest under a shirt? That makes no sense. <laughs> I'm not sure. That would be weird. We should remember that. Anyway, keep it real. Um, you know, we can we can open it up to questions now, but when you when when you start to admit one bad idea, as we all know, it opens the door to accepting all kinds of bad ideas. It's basically the same thought process. Do we have questions in the chat here? How does that work? We do have some questions in the chat. Michael, Judy, can you pick them and read them for me? Well, I was going to see if Michael wanted to ask his questions out loud. Okay. Yeah, sure. I was just wondering about the methodology of this because, you know, um, like you're saying, you know, the young or old and all that, I mean, all that seems very subjective. And to, I mean, I would argue the point that you're saying less educated. I mean, I know a lot of very well educated people that are very prone to conspiracy theories. I mean, as you said, we're very interpretive animals. And in many ways, more educated people are in some ways more prone to conspiracy theories because it's you know they're more 
you present the facts enough to them, convincingly enough to them, they're going to question them just as little as someone less educated. So, I mean, basically, I'm just wondering about the methodology and all that. Um, so, the last time I updated this talk, which was the beginning of this year, um, I talked to Joe Yuzinski, is the, is the professor I know at U University of Miami, who's the head of this lab that does all of the surveys and that has this enormous warehouse of survey data. All I can tell you is it's survey data. So when we look at people's tendency toward conspiracy ideation, education level is one of the things that correlates and it correlates highest with lower educated people. Um, why that is what he told me and what they have written about in the papers that they've published at their lab. Um, and he's been a co-author with, I mean, countless dozens of other researchers on the same topic is it basically boils down to what we talked about, life experience, who's had a harder road, who has had bad things actually come through more often than not. And lower educated people have bad things come through more often than higher educated people. Yes, can you find exceptions? Absolutely. Can you find well-educated people who are conspiracy theorists? Absolutely. Again, I reiterate, these are like 48, 49% to 51, 52% statistically significant, but just barely. Really, conspiracy ideation cuts equally across all demographics. Well, the so, surveys were done by who, though? By labs all around the world. I mean, I mean who are they? I mean, because, you know, it's a different, if you're surveying a bunch of college students, you're going to get a lot different uh, data than if you're surveying, say, people at a gun show or surveying people at a, a flat earth conference or people at a, a skeptic convention. So I'm, I'm pretty wondering. sure they don't go to any groups that are that extreme to do their to do their surveying. Uh, they're more likely telephone surveys. You'd have to actually look at the papers to get the methodology. I can't sit here and, and, and recite. I mean, we're talking about thousands of papers over decades. So it's a it's a tremendously huge data set. So um, there's not going to be one super simple answer to your question. Does that help, Michael? Not really, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I invite you to go to the University of Miami website. They do have a public information portal. Um, I can't tell you what the address is. You'll just have to Google for it. And you can drill down and start to find some of that data. Okay. Or just search for Joe Yuzinski in Google Scholar or any of those. Um, any of How do you spell his name? I'll put it in chat. Yuzinski? Yeah. Well, I mean, this this is one guy of, here, I'll type it Yeah. Out. Uh, so, Brian, uh, you're a science communicator, right? Yes. So you're, you're basically a science reporter. Yes. Uh, and generally, do science reporters do research or do they just report on the, the research that they read? Yeah, no, I'm a science writer. I'm not a researcher. Right. Um, no, I just wanted to kind of put that out there because I wanted to make sure I we all understood where you stood and what your um what your role here was not necessarily uh knowing about methodology and knowing about the all the papers that have been written you can only cite them not necessarily say that you've you know that you've vetted them or written them correct yeah my job is the job of all science writers really is to be a go-between between the researchers and the general public to synthesize everything that's been done that's been learned and found out into a form that makes sense that's interesting and it's good for public consumption. So it's very possible for people in my position to introduce their own biases, for example. Um, and so one thing that most of us try to do very hard is to avoid that. We're trying to make a presentation that's interesting and engaging and that gets people excited about knowledge and, 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 and science um, without giving it any kind of a spin that, that differs from whatever the, the consensus is on that particular topic. Um, I feel I do a pretty good job at that, and I, I feel I can back that up. But um, of course, uh, like I remember the first slide here, everyone everyone has a different opinion about uh, about science writers and science communicators, and few of them are favorable. Well, it's it's really hard now to know who to trust, and if you haven't been, I mean, we kind of threw you in this mix without a, a really strong introduction or your your uh, long background into how long you've been writing and stuff like that so that um, it's it's always good 
to me, it's always good to want to know about the person you're getting information from and how likely they are to um, uh, skew it in such a way. But I do, um, I'm sorry, I've got some people who've raised their hands. Um, but I, I, you know, I wouldn't have asked you here if I, if I didn't trust you, so. Well, I, I appreciate that. But I, I think you did a pretty good job reading my bio. I mean, that's, yeah. if nobody's heard of me at all, then that's as good as they're gonna get. And it's <laughs> better than you're gonna get in most cases, so. Um, we do have another question from uh, Jim Peterson, who wanted to know what is the the most long lasting conspiracy theory. Oh God! I mean, it's it's got to be JFK. It's it just won't die to this Not day. The Illuminati. No, I I mean I mean yeah, the, I mean that's been around since the eighteen hundreds, but right. but but JFK is really the one that yes. that's still to this day literally obsesses people and takes over their lives. I, mm. I, I still get, you know, 20,000 word emails uh, where people send me their theories. And why do you think that I'm going to promote your theory? Why are you even talking to me? If you know anything about me, you know that yours is the theory I'm going to hit delete on quicker than any other. Um, it's, it's just ridiculous that, um, that, that people cannot get past this idea of I mean, just like I said before, this is one of the things you should not question because it has been questioned to death. Tens of thousands of people have dedicated their lives to who killed JFK and nobody has come up with anything. Nothing has ever been found. No evidence, no evidence disputes the official story, which I put in quotes because it's come to be a swear word. Um, I'm Maybe, sorry, yeah. you're not going to find out anything new. If you do, great. Don't convince me. Go convince law enforcement. Yeah. We, Once they make the ruling, then I'll be convinced. And I'll we be. have a, a good friend who is very convinced that. May, may I add to my question? Oh, that, sure. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I actually had in mind was uh, historically, especially going back centuries, and most uh, usually uh, such conspiracy theories have a religious basis. Okay. Anything of that sort that you'd like to cite? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I can think of two right off the bat. Um, and they they tend to all have with, with Jewish people, um, unfortunately. Um, one of them was pandemic conspiracy theories. When we had the Black Plague in Europe, it was blamed on the Jews. It was blamed on any number of people for any number of reasons. I thought but it was blamed Jews on cats. Pardon me? I thought it was blamed on cats. Cats? I'm sure there were people yeah. who blamed it on cats, but again, it's it's one where the Jews came up. And, you know, the Jews being um, behind pretty much anything, any evil that anyone could come up with, in my own personal assessment, I have not written on this, it's my own personal assessment, is that it goes back to the Bible story of the Jews, the ones who turned in Jesus to the Romans. Therefore, the Jews are permanently going to be considered evil. Um, I would say that that's the one that goes back about as far as I can think of. I don't have anything older than 2,000 years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne, you have a question? Yeah. Thank you, Judy. <clears throat> thank you, Brian, for your information, for your time today. I was just what? curious. Um, do you know the backstory of QAnon? What's the demographics of the people that are involved in QAnon? Yeah, so the QAnon is basically believed to be Ron and Jim Watkins, um, and there's substantial data that I think we can call it a fact, who are the father and son team who ran the 4chan message board, which was a, it was an Originally, it was an image board, basically just an internet web page where people uploaded images and, and some comments or something. Essentially, the content was overwhelmingly racist, pornographic, illegal content. I mean, just 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 the, the worst sewer, sewer of the internet. And this is where they started posting these QAnon claims. Um, claiming that, hey, you know, call me Q because that's my secret level and I'm an insider with the Trump administration 
and Hillary Clinton is going to be arrested for child pornography tomorrow. And I thought you'd all be delighted to hear that. And that is, that's really the backstory of Q. And it grew from there. It's believed that one or two other people may have contributed to the postings, um, even as it moved from 4chan to 8chan to 8kun. And I don't even know if where it went from there. I kind of gave up on that a few years ago after UFOs took over <laughs> the bulk of what my workload turns out to be. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and these were just guys who were just far right nuts. Um, and to me, the, the, greatest, the greatest irony in the whole Q thing is that they accused prominent Democrats of running child pornography. And that's what Trump was going to, you know, clean out and, and get rid of. When in fact, it was the guys posting as Q themselves, who were probably the world's greatest child pornographers with their, their stupid 4chan website. Um, there's just there's just nothing good that <laughs> coming coming from QAnon. How it came to be believed by otherwise intelligent professional people, it just boggles my mind because the basic claim is that insiders in the in the presidential administration decided to publicly announce these secret investigations and um, classified information. And the method by which they chose to announce it to the public was an obscure internet forum known for pornography and assorted illegal content. And that seemed rational to the people who believe in it, you know, the large Marge and, and Lauren Boebert and, and, and all of that, that crew who's somehow managed to get into Congress on the strength of being QAnon conspiracy theorists. It really just, it's going to be consuming social psychologists for decades. Um, the, the failure in mode analysis of how QAnon came to take such a prominent role, even among government insiders, it's really astonishing to me. Yeah. Well, I know in, around here in Florida, they, they lured people in by talking about the children and you have to come protect. The Save the children. children. Yeah. Save the children. And, yeah. Yeah. But not from guns. Yeah, not from not yet from the um, <laughs> from books. from the Hollywood insiders who are trying yes. to extract adrenochrome from their bodies and sell right. them into slavery or whatever it was. Who knows? Okay, thank you. Um, did that answer your question enough? To the degree that there is an answer, I don't see how you can. Uh, yeah. Better. Okay. <laughs> um, Jim Young. I just wanted to. Uh, Can't hear you, Jim. Speak up. I, I, can you hear me? I can hear now. Okay. Barely. I just wanted to uh, comment that immediately when you began this presentation with your definition and description of the criteria for conspiracy theory and how they differed from a conspiracy. Um, and you actually put these points on the screen. I was really very, very impressed. It has not been very long ago. We had a presentation about con conspiracy theories. And when that presentation was done, I was, I, I, I left that meeting not satisfied at all that the presenter knew what the hell he was talking about. But I can tell you right now that within five minutes of you starting this uh, presentation, I was able to grasp a much better understanding of what characterize, characterizes a conspiracy theory specifically. And I just wanted to tell you, pass that on. I really am very impressed. And I can tell you that the people here who know me, I'm a hard person to please. Yes, he well, is. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Jim. That's well, much for that. I deeply appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, we will vouch for that. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> um, Lydia. Uh, yes. 
So I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know if you know anything about Seventh-day Adventist, but they train us from the very beginning that we are going to be persecuted for our beliefs. And there's going to be a one world system and we need to be prepared. We had drills and we we just had stuff go on. We had drills and we had this methodology or whatever for, for preparing children for the end of the world, like making them ma making us go without food for two or three days and severe punishment of like uh, doing without basic necessities. So in and, and saying all that, so does that make my family members because my brother believes in really extreme things does that make me and my family more susceptible to believing these Joe Rogan and all these theories uh, interesting I guess by the by the by the definition that I gave of what 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 differs between these two statistically significant groups I mean superficially I'd say yes but I mean we're talking about very general trends. I think trying to apply very general trends to any individual person is something that's almost certain to be wrong. I would think that only a, a very qualified psychotherapist or someone would be able to, who thoroughly understood your situation, might be able to come up with a better answer to that. So I, I would never tread into what I think your personal background impact might have on your beliefs. That's something I'm least qualified of everyone here to do. I'm sorry you had that experience, but um, I, no, I'm I did just, not I'm express just, my thoughts on whether that has left you permanently damaged or not. No, that that's not that's not my thing. Is 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 not that I want sympathy or empathy or somebody to feel sorry for me or whatever. I'm just trying to understand that if I'm just trying to understand my brother and why that he's. Hmm. He believes the way that he does. So that's all I'm, I'm I'm trying to come to some rationalization and some methodology to try to understand my family and other if that other people's family that believes in these conspiracy theories and coming to some kind of rationalization and some kind of scientific point me towards something scientific that would make me less vulnerable to that situation and how to explain why people understand these things or why people believe these things, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it, it makes perfect sense. And I, I, I would have to repeat what I said before that I'm reporting general trends from large data sets. And I guess we can, we can we'd, be, we'd be correct if we said statistically, yes, that may make him more likely to believe in certain kinds of things. But um, I, I really wouldn't want to go any further than that. Um, okay. That's I what I'm just not remotely qualified to do. Yeah. Lydia, I can tell you that um, I know people who are not from a, um, a dysfunctional background. I, I, I say that because I grew up in the Church of Nazarene, which is a fundamentalist church and had very bizarre things. And um, but um, I know people that didn't grow up in that background who are conspiracy theorists with QAnon and the whole nine yards. And so it's, it, I, it can't just be that, but there is, I think it makes you prone to believing in, in certain things when you're raised in a dysfunctional family. Okay. All right. That answers my question. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Sorry, it's not the answer you were looking for, but <laughs> if I can't I, I, give it, I'm not going to pretend that I can. Well, it's still the fact that there's not an answer. There's never going to be an answer. And there is no uh, scientific methodology that I can follow from one end to the other to try to explain that hmm. at all. That's what I'm looking for. And that, that there's not. So you answered my question. Well, I would, I, I mean, I, I only say this because my wife is a psychotherapist and we talk about this stuff all the time. I do feel that there is potential for some important work to be done via that profession, but yeah. I, 
I think that could that could probably lead to some some discoveries which might give you better answers. But um, yeah. I in we're no not, way can I can I say that here. We're not we're not there yet as far as a scientific methodology for finding a step from A to D or whatever for how that develops in somebody's neural pathways and why this trauma might affect somebody's belief system or not belief system. We're just not there yet with coming up with a scientific process to do that as of yet. Okay, I that would that doesn't jive with my experience, but um, again, I can't say anything about yours. Well, there there are, there is psychometrics. Uh, there's uh, that um, misinformation. Uh, what is it called? Oh crap! Missing for the misinformation susceptibility test. Uh, yes. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, the the skeptic guide folks were talking about it yesterday, and it, I thought that that's where your questions came from because uh, it it crosses over with some of the questions uh, that that are in that test, which are the the age, the um, uh, economic uh, standing, all of that stuff was is part of that, and uh, that test found that the same answers that you had. Um, well, I happen to know that they're friends with Joe Yuzinski too, so <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. no so, surprise there. <laughs> I, I don't know if if because I was looking for it to see if I can find a test online, but most of the the links I find are just um, uh, you know uh, reports on the test, and yeah. uh, it's it's very it's very cool. Actually, Hugo is the one that Tara um, Tara on, on the other podcast was mentioning um, that they had a report on there. It's, I, I put a link earlier in the chat uh, and I think it's worth taking a good look at it because it, it's really interesting how- Oh, cool. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll put okay. it there again because um, maybe um, there it is. So that's actually um, uh, pretty, pretty telling. Because I think they even go into uh, what party people belong to, and it's funny to see that there's not that much of a difference <laughs> in the results uh, yeah. in some ways. Although uh, Democrats do tend to to uh, be less prone to believing certain things uh, than Republicans, and, and more prone to believe in certain other things. Right. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. that's what stumped, jumped out at me as the most surprising thing to most audiences, is because. No matter who I'm speaking to, if it's a prominent, predominantly Republican audience or predominantly Democratic audience, they all feel the other side is all wrong and they're the only ones that have it right. And they all feel their tribe is is immune from misinformation and the other tribe believes everything that's false. It's just we have this extreme political division uh, these last few years. Yes. I think that's that's just what's forefront on so many people's minds. Um and so that's, I think that's where, that's why they go there first. Oh, that's not, the oh it's men or women. No, it's not that it's Republicans or Democrats. Yeah. That's where people see the sides of the war right now, this imaginary culture war that shouldn't even exist. Um, thank you, Anthony. Did you want to ask about area 51? You have that in the chat. Oh, no, no. I, I put that on there because when, when uh, someone asked what the old, oldest uh, conspiracy you, you remember was, uh, yeah. okay, I thought that Area 51 happened before that, it was in 47. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. That's why I, I was just, it wasn't really a question. It was just a comment. And it is, it is a pretty strong theory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's still, they're, they're still having hearings in Congress. It's, it's yes. Ridiculous. Okay, uh, Jim Young. I wanted to uh, bring up one other thing about your poll. You did not ask whether people who are religious are more recept uh, susceptible to conspiracy theories versus people who are non-religious. And I wanted to comment that we as human beings are conditioned from the moment of birth to pretend that we know things that are unknowable. And we're encouraged to do that. We're encouraged by our parents and our other mentors to pretend to know things that we cannot possibly know. 
And nobody's pushing back against that except the free thought, the critical thinking communities. Uh, so I'll ask my question, why is that not part of your presentation? Because there's no statistical difference between religiosity and tendency to believe in conspiracy theories. This is a simple question and a simple answer. There are exactly five of those dichotomies where there's a statistically significant difference. And we went through all five of them. And none of them are different. Is that what I just heard you say? There's no, no difference. Sorry? Uh, uh, you stated your answer so quickly, I did not absorb it. Would, are you saying that those five criteria apply to both equally? Is that what I just heard? Those, the five criteria that I, the, the five dichotomies, younger, older, richer, poorer, more or less educated, male, female, black and white, are the only five demographic categories for which there's a statistically significant difference in conspiracy ideation. Religiosity, there is no statistically significant difference. So uh -huh. as, a, as an atheist activist, you may be very well prone to want to believe that religious people are more likely to be conspiracy theorists, but I'm sorry to inform you that the data does not reflect that. Well, actually, that is not a prejudice that I have, because I believe that all of us are essentially nurtured to think that we can know the unknowable. Uh, it just seems like it's a common thread throughout humanity that we are prone to to embrace these uh, things that are fed to us as knowledge which which have no evidence to back them up they're they're not even falsifiable and and yet we embrace them readily and and almost no one is pushing back saying hey wait a minute you shouldn't be uh, jumping on this bandwagon and, and buying into pretending you can know things that if you stop and think about it, there is absolutely no way you can know them. There, they, there's no way to test them for veracity. Uh, so I'm, I'm really of the position that it's something that, con that cuts across all cultures, religious or non-religious, as well, but yet I think that this phenomena in our education does have the effect of making us susceptible to embracing conspiracies. I, I would agree. In fact, I, if I understand, and I, I, I'm, I'm only able to hear about 50% of what you're saying. Your, your volume is very low. But if what I'm if what I'm understanding is correct, that's basically the premise of the talk that I just gave. But it's something that is very yeah, native in all. I, of us. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't trying to make any point to undermine anything you said in your in your presentation. In fact, I really was on board, uh, very much so, with your presentation. And I want to also say that Michael Pollack is another person who I'm going to say questions everything. <laughs> and I really appreciate Michael's comments in the chat. I just want to let him know that. Thank you, Jim. And Michael is up next with a question. Yes, I'm going to have to prove him right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, so if I get this straight, I mean, you're basically just a, a science a communicator, not so much a scientist, right? Correct. Okay, so um, my question is maybe more on a journalistic side. I mean, because I think you just mentioned, too, you know, we're journalists. I mean, you basically all have, you know, the biases and all that. That I mean, that's, you know, scientists have it, too. I mean, you're not going to get away from that, period. We all have biases and stereotypes, even those of us who think we don't. And so I'm just kind of um, wondering, 
Like, what is it exactly that you're trying to communicate? Like you personally, like what, what's your main goal that you want to get through to us, your main message? If people can better understand what's real from what's not real, they can make better life decisions. You can base your in, you can base your life decisions on good information rather than bad information, and that's going to be better for everyone in the long run. That's basically the motivation behind why I do what I do. Okay. And there's a I thought it was an interesting question too um, in the chat with Dominic said you know the black versus white dichotomy and that that was kind of one of the thing that you know is my big sticking point is you know I'm a cultural anthropologist and you say black and white and stuff like that. I mean, immediately that kind of puts my fur up because there's, you know, black and white is like, that's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. What do you mean by black and white? Who do you, who's those people that you're qualifying as black and white or even less educated and more educated? I mean, what education are you talking about? College education, Ivy League, um, stuff like that. So, I mean, I just kind of want to let you know, I mean, I am very data driven. Yes, I am questioning stuff and I do question stuff and I will grill everyone. I'm not just picking on you. So I don't That's want true. you to feel like I'm just picking on you trying to, you know, I like what you're saying. I do like what you're saying. I like, you know, the message that you're getting out there, but I'm also trying to get out there that, you know, just even stuff you completely agree with, if you're not questioning it, then, you know, that's, you're very prone to being conspiracy theorists in the other direction. Um, you know, I have this argument all the time, you know, my stepfather, he talks about all the time, oh, the, the, the conservatives believe in this nonsense and this nonsense. And I'm like, well, the, us liberals kind of believe in a lot of nonsense too. You know, um, and um, another thing too is giving me a bunch of newspaper articles really doesn't convince me either. So I'd like to give that out there to uh, Anthony. So that's, uh, I am very sort of data driven in the fact that, and this is my own bias, my own prejudice, where I look towards more, peer review, double blind study, stuff like that. So just a pure newspaper article is not going to make me convinced of anything unless I know what's behind that. So that's kind of why I'm grilling you. Anyway, that's my very long winded. Yo, sort you'd of. have to do a lot better than that before I'd feel grilled or picked on. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I'm not in any way trying to put you down or anything. I just want to put no, that I, out there. I'm just all. trying to question, you know, not at all the questions out there. That's all. You know, when you're, when you're given a talk to a group, you can you can afford to spend so much time when you're on, on on each point and you have part of being a science writer better being an effective science writer is boiling things down to the point where people understand if i tried to go into a complete explanation of um what's the difference between higher educated and, and lo lesser educated i expect i would i would lose most of the audience before i would satisfy what you're asking for and so in the interest of trying to do the most good and appealing and reaching the most people, I have to find a happy medium of boiling things down to, to a point that's simple and clear for most people. So I mean, that's, yeah. that's what I do. The resources, I always provide all the references and everything. So if you went to the corresponding episode, podcast episode for this talk on my website, you would have the complete list of references and that's where you'd be able to get everything that you're looking for. Okay. And I will I will include those in the page when we put up our um, our YouTube video. Yeah, that. I mean, that, that's just because, you know, in anthropology, I can't tell you how many times we've had science reporters come across and just report stuff that was just totally not what was said. You know, they totally misunderstand the stuff that was said. So that's why I'm so adamant about show me the sources and that. I would love to see actually give a talk on how exactly science journalists interpret science for the masses, but that's a whole different subject. But. Thanks, Michael. Um, one thing that um, Dominic said in the chat was that he found the black versus white dichotomy way too simplifying. And if I remember correctly, you said that you boiled it down to black versus white, even though there were other uh, ethnic groups in the uh, survey data, but those were the two groups that had the most differences. Is that correct? The two, the, the, that was the only two groups when you compare them head to head where there was a statistically significant difference. Okay, and that's why you kept it at black. Yeah, which which I found surprising. I mean, but yeah. uh, nevertheless. I would have, yeah, I would have thought 
there would be other groups that were different, but okay. Uh, Jim Peterson. Yeah, so I, I wanted to um, say thank you very much for this presentation because I, I think that your work is among the most important that there is to be done out there. People could understand how conspiracy theories get started, learn not to question everything, but to ask the right questions. And uh, that that is uh, an extremely important skill, simply because conspiracies are often at the heart of some of the very worst things that humanity experiences. Uh, things like uh, terrorist attacks and uh, <clears throat> even wars are caused by various kinds of unanchored conspiracy theories getting around. Uh, World War I is a good example, but they're all good examples in their own way. And uh, so, uh, again, I wanted to thank you very much for bringing all this up, bringing it to our attention. It may not have uh, the, the, the personal explanatory power that some of us would like, but in general, if we want to understand ourselves as human beings and human history, uh, what what the comprehensive area of knowledge that you're exposing for us here uh, really is very useful. Thank you. Well, you're, you're most welcome. Thank you very much for saying that. It's very, very kind of you. Okay, are there any other questions anyone wants to ask uh, before uh, we let Brian Dunning go? Dominic. Yeah, I make it very brief because I know there's millions of questions. I'd just be very, thanks for everything. And um, be quick, the the name Bri uh, Mick West, who is the name in uh, debunking UFO, UFOs, what do you make of it? And what's your your view on, on him as a, um, he's in a similar area like you, debunking and yeah. what do you think? So Mick is a friend of mine, I should I should point that out. Um, I, I, just, I just finished, um, uh, our, our next feature documentary film, which is called the UFO movie, they don't want you to see. <laughs> and it's just going out, it's just starting going out into film festivals and going out to distributors and stuff. So there's no release date for it yet. But Mick is actually in a, a 20 minute segment of that film, where we go through, uh, I guess, four of the popular videos that have been shown as, you know, proof of aliens or whatever. And he gives um, he gives the explanations for what you're actually seeing in these videos. And with the advantage of, you know, film editing and, and multiple cameras and everything and, and um, going back and asking questions and shooting again, and we're able to make a very, very, very compelling presentation that I think goes a long way toward making the basic points that Mick and I are always trying to make, which is you can't simply accept the um, the obvious television soundbite explanation for what's on a video that you have to have some understanding of, you know, in this case, if you're going by video screens from an F-18, no one is qualified to make any interpretation of what's on that screen unless you know what all the numbers mean, unless you know exactly what's, what's going on in the whole situation. So, um, I think I think Mick is doing fantastic work. Mick is fortunate in that you know he was able to retire fairly young in his career and is able to devote full time to doing this this kind of work. And this is you know by no means does he consider himself to be a a UFO guy. This is just something that he fell into and that gained a lot of traction and that he started getting tons of phone calls from reporters and had to put more time into than he otherwise would have. Um, it's it's no more or less interesting to him than any of the other things going on in his life. He is, you know, by no means a crackpot or an obsessed individual. And um, I have found that all the work he's been doing is exceptionally well done. He's got a great advantage in his background of uh, doing 3D physics um, in software, representing 3D physics in software is what he did for his career. Um, in, in video games. Um, and, you know, you forget the video game companies, they employ actual physicists, and they actually know what they're doing in order to make a realistic presentation of a game on the screen. And so when he goes and he creates his recreations of, of these, um, these UFO videos, he's able to do it with a thorough foundation of knowledge 
and comprehension of what the possibilities are for explaining the video that the average person doesn't have. So um, I've probably gone on longer than you needed, but um, I think Mick does great work. I support his work to the point that I put him in 20 minutes of my, my newest movie, um, which you can see at the UFO.movie. Ah, uh, okay. I can I'll make sure to, it. yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'll make sure to include that on our, our um, YouTube uh, description of the video. Uh, maybe we can get you some traffic and get you some donations. Yay. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or anything they want to say before we close down? I, I want to thank you very much for coming and um, and talking with us because I'm like Jim, I, I uh, uh, feel very uh, concerned about the level of critical thinking that's uh, at work in our country right now and how we can better help people um, learn to critically think um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. I understand what you're saying. It's certainly, <laughs> I, I certainly think it's about the most important thing that uh, that someone can do. And I'm 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 very fortunate to have been lucky enough in, you know, starting with just the podcast and being able to turn it into an actual full time job. And now for half a dozen people, and you know, we're actually a, an actual going company. Yeah, uh, that's wonderful. Turning out material to the to the best that we're able to. So I feel singularly fortunate to be in that position and certainly obligated to do the best job that I can do because we're, we're donation driven. So if we don't do the best work, we don't make any money. Right. You, do you have any recommendations for children's books on critical thinking? Children's books? Um, I haven't seen a great deal. Um, yeah. we, we made one that we published in 2013, maybe. Um, I'm sure where you'd find that. It's available. <laughs> well, that's a great pitch, isn't it? Um, it, it it's called The Secret of the Gypsy Queen. It's, a, it's about a little girl in a village who, who saves the day when she's the only one who doesn't buy into the popular pseudoscience that's including ah. everyone else. So it's, it's you, you can find it at skeptoid.org under the books section or the store section. Or, um, but that's really the only one I know of. I haven't really... Mm -hmm. Does anyone remember Encyclopedia Brown series? Oh God, I loved Encyclopedia Brown. I had all of those. <laughs> also, Junior Skeptic with that. Uh, I think Laxon is his name. Daniel Laxon. Like yeah. yeah. Um. Actually, um. Did someone else have a question? Actually, I wanted to do a recommendation on critical thinking, but it's not a book. It's a cartoon. Does anybody remember the Scooby-Doo series? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, introducing your kids to those cartoons, if there's anybody's got kids, because always when they have a supernatural case, it always ends up being a natural hmm. uh, answer to it, if anybody remembers that. For sure. He was one guy that owns the trailer park or something, wearing a mask. Yeah. Are you going to explain to your kids why Shaggy is always hungry? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, in this, Eleanor, your question about uh, is this going to be available? Yes, we're, we're recording it so that we will put it up on YouTube and make it available uh, within the next, uh, by the end of this week, for sure. Um, where can we find the, the YouTube ad? I'm sorry for interrupting. I didn't mean to. Um, it's, it's on the Atheist of Florida YouTube channel. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So thank you again so much. We really enjoyed it. I think, um, I got a lot out of it and I hope other people did too. And we had a very good discussion in the, um, chat, um, it is important that we not name call, but other than that, um, it, it went very well. I think it's okay to question people and also to question the questioning. So 
Um, anyway, so thank you very much. I will uh, let you know when the the video is up, and it's um, and you'll get a chance to give me any feedback on the on what's in it. Um, next week we will be having, and I'm going to ask Jim to announce it because I can say the name correctly. <laughs> Jim, you want to tell them. You're muted, Jim. <laughs> there we are. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say I can't remember his name, except for the fact that he is one of the um, one of the important uh, Massimo Massimo Pelucci. Pelucci, Max Massimo Pelucci. I'm sure he's familiar with, to anyone who subscribes to uh, the uh, um, the, uh, the the CFI magazines um, uh, and, uh, and 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 a good many other humanist oriented publications. Uh, he's uh, been around, I don't know, for thirty or forty years, and uh, his uh, his his insights are written in a popular style, and I think you will find it to be. Uh, very, very interesting. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Brian. It's very nice meeting you and, and um, getting to put a face with the voice. So thank you for having me. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and hope to see you next week. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. If you are pleased with our programs, please tap the like button and then subscribe to our channel. Don't forget the bell so you don't miss any notices of new material. We usually post new content every week. See our created playlists to discover events thus far this year or to see a list of topics and speakers from our rapidly growing and diverse collection since 1992.